Cinepids on Oaks, Sex and Violence in a Nutshell. Uh, all will become clear about that phrase, I hope, uh, as we go through the talk. Um, I think you've picked a very good subject to open a conference called the Circle of Life, um, because um, cinepid gall wasps in general have uh, quite complex life cycles. So their circle of life is pretty complicated. Um, and uh, as recorders, you can record the uh, adult galls if you can identify them. You need separate keys for the insects, uh, but you can record the uh, the adults, the galls themselves without opening them, uh, usually with cinepids, um, and then also um, the larva and pupa that you will find inside the galls. Um, I think this is something that might be familiar to you all in Scotland. It's one of our most prominent cinepid galls on oak. Um, it's called a nopper gall. It's one of the ones that's got a common name. Most of them haven't, but this one has. Uh, the nopper gall, which forms between the acorn cup and the acorn andricus quercus calicus. Um, and so uh, that one I'm sure you will have in your records in your centre. Uh, but what are galls? Uh, a question that's often asked and there is this is the most straightforward answer. Um, growth of plant tissue, uh, which involve uh, both an increase or either an increase in the size or the number of cells or both, and also provide food and shelter for the gall causa. So gall causes are specialized herbivores and not content with just chomping away at plant tissue. Uh, they've evolved to take over some of the host plant's DNA uh, and produce, uh, produce growths that we call galls within which they live and feed and which give them protection from the elements uh, and from enemies uh, and uh, a more comfortable life perhaps than the herbivores on the outside. Uh, some people have suggested that the galls are beneficial to the plants as well so it's a symbiotic relationship but that, generally speaking, is, uh, is not accepted. The, the benefit to the plant being that the damage the herbivore is doing is limited to uh, just to the area of the gall and the gall tissue. But that's probably not so because the, uh, the gall insects are themselves diverting the plant's resources, both to produce the gall and to provide the nutritious cells within the gall, uh, which they eat. You can find galls uh, everywhere on plants uh, and on many, many families of plants. Um, gall causes tend to be uh, uh, to have narrow host preferences to families or genera, sometimes even to species, um, uh, unlike more generalist uh, herbivores. But they do occur, as you can see, uh, on every part of a plant. So some galls you need to get down on your hands and knees to find or to examine. Uh, and some galls, if you're so minded, uh, you need a, a ladder to get up into the tops of trees to see. Uh, but this is, uh, this is where they're found mainly on leaves, as you can see, more than 60% uh, of all galls are found on the leaves. Um, and uh, with each slide, there's often, uh, there's gonna be pictures coming up like this one on the side. So you get an idea of what some of the galls look like. Um, and this one, is, uh, is one of the, uh, what's called the Aleppo galls. Uh, these were used in trade because galls on oaks concentrate tannin. And tannin is very useful in the dyeing, and as the name suggests, the tanning industries. So uh, it's had quite an impact on the distribution of galls throughout Europe, the trading galls over the centuries. Um, this is uh, where they sit taxonomically. Uh, in the Apocrita section of the Hymenoptera. Uh, used to be called Parasitica, but that's not a very sound taxonomic division. So these days we tend to refer to them uh, as the Apocrita. It's the section that includes ants, bees and wasps um, and parasitic wasps. Um, and in fact, uh, the cinepids are uh, oddballs uh, in the family that they're in. Uh, because they're herbivores, most cinepids, in fact, are parasitic wasps of 
other insects. Uh, and the same goes for the, the few chalcid wasp species that cause galls. Um, most chalcids are also paras parasitoids, to be precise. Um, but a few have evolved into um, herbivores. Uh, the evolution uh, is thought to have started about 140 million years ago. Uh, the oldest fossil galls date from around about that time. Now, this is uh, a, a group of galls um, that we're talking about today that only occur on oak trees. And uh, oak trees themselves are quite interesting. Um, there are only two uh, native oak species uh, in the United Kingdom, Quercus roba, as the one on the left here is, um, and Quercus petraea. Uh, they also, those two hybridise, when they're found together, they hybridise very freely uh, and produce a hybrid called Quercus birosaceae. Um, and at one time, um, Forest ecologists considered that oak trees were the climax vegetation, that uh, wherever they were, that the forests were heading for. Um, but that's not so now. Um, it's been discovered they're actually a subclimax species, and things like elm uh, and even birch will ultimately outcompete them. They are at the edge, edge of their range here in Northwest Europe, which is why we've only got two species. Um, because the genus Quercus is a warm, temperate and tropical montane genus. And it has, believe it or not, about 450 species. Most of them are in Mexico, where there are about 200 species, 125 of them endemic to Mexico. Um, it contains trees and shrubs, uh, evergreen and deciduous um, examples, about 50-50 evergreen and uh, deciduous actually, um, and they're mainly found in the northern hemisphere. So they're abundant, for instance, in China, Japan, uh, Malaysia, but also parts of Indonesia, North America, uh, and indeed, as we know here in Northwest Europe. Um, but there are some very important introduced oak species um, for the gall wasps, and in particular, and I'll tell you more about this in a few minutes, uh, Quercus ceris, uh, which is the turkey oak, which has been widely planted over the past three or four hundred years in this country, uh, and um, uh, Quercus ilex, uh, the one in the middle here, which is uh, what we call in this country the evergreen oak, or the home oak, H-O-L-M. Uh, uh, where you are in Scotland, uh, Roba is uh, more common uh, in the east of Scotland, uh, Ross and Cromarty and uh, that side of, of the country. And Petraea is more common in West Scotland. Um, so I suppose you probably get both where you are because I think you're about in the middle, aren't you? Um, so the, the common, uh, oh, sorry. And uh, I, I, just to mention two other oaks that are widely planted in uh, Arboreta and generally speaking, uh, around the countryside, are lucum oak and cork oaks, uh, which are closely related to turkey oak. And they, they also uh, will um, host uh, gall insects. The one thing that links all oaks together uh, is that the fruit is a nut sitting in a cup. And that's what we call the acorn. Um, and they are, they are, of course, in the beech family, the Fagaceae. Um, and we call it the beech family, but I've not been able to verify this, but I think I heard somewhere once that Fagaceae is actually the Latin for oak. So somewhere along the line, it changed from the oak family to the beech family. So the circle of life. Um, I hope you're familiar with the oak apple. Lots of galls are called oak apples, but there's only one that is. Um, and I'll show you a, a, a slide of it in a moment. Um, and this is. Uh, typical of uh, cinepid wasps in that it has what's called alternation of generations. So um, we'll start with uh, root galls, obviously very rarely seen. Um, you have to really look for them, obviously, and dig down for them. So um, there are galls on the roots of oak trees, which produce 
Agamic, and in this case, wingless, but that, that's uh, unusual uh, to have wingless uh, gull wasps. Uh, agamic wingless females uh, that have spent two winters developing in the root galls. And agamic uh, means that they can reproduce asexually. They, they, the females don't need to mate um, to lay eggs and produce the next generation. So the agamic females spend two winters developing in these galls. Uh, and in uh, late winter, uh, early spring, uh, female wasps, you can see here, the wasp with no wings, emerges from the galls. And this little wasp, about three or four millimetres long, then has to walk all the way up the bowl of the tree, out along the branches and twigs, find the buds and lay their eggs in the buds. Those eggs, now I can't see what's coming up because the people are on the right hand side of my screen. But uh, you can now see, I think, uh, some oak apple galls. Um, typically they have a, a, a pink hue when they're young and then they become brown, dry, brown and dry uh, later. And they produce both males and female wasps. Um, but only, only, uh, only males in some galls and only females in some galls. There, there, there aren't males and females in both galls. Uh, the female, they emerge in the summer, they mate, uh, and then the females uh, go down to the roots, lay their eggs, and the whole thing starts uh, all over again. Um, the oak apples themselves can be as big as 40 millimetres in diameter. Um, and contain up to 400 larvae, both of the gall causes and of other insects which take advantage of the gall, which we will come to in a moment. Uh, and about the limit of my uh, genetic knowledge is that in both generations, the females are diploid uh, and the males are haploid. So we'll just have a quick look at uh, some of the galls that you might see. I, I don't know uh, what the situation is with gall recording in Scotland. Uh, we're trying in the society at the moment to um, sort out the eye record species dictionary, um, which is quite complex with uh, gall insects and wh whether you record in the galls or the insects and some of the taxonomy of mite galls in particular is very confused and confusing. But we're trying to sort out species dictionary so that we can uh, start to coordinate records on eye record and learn more about distributions. So here are uh, just a selection of galls. Um, uh, you can see the names uh, on the slide. There's about, uh, Andricus has about a hundred species worldwide and we have about 30 in Britain. Uh, I say about 30 because the uh, number of species is increasing all the time and it has been for the past 50 years and particularly over the last 20 years or so. Um, so uh, the one on the left, uh, Calidoma, um, uh, you'll find that uh, all through the summer from May to about August. Um, it has an alternate generation, the sexual generation, um, which uh, causes galls high in oak trees. One of the ones you need a ladder to find, uh, which looks a bit like um, cotton wool. And I'll show you another gall that looks like that in a moment. Um, this one in the middle here is uh, embedded in the bark of low growing twigs. Um, and uh, sometimes yeah, if you dig around the leaf litter and the moss around the base of a tree, you will often find this one. Now, this is one where the whole life cycle is not yet known uh, because we, we haven't yet found the sexual generation galls in Britain. They're very obscure galls. Uh, in, um, in small twigs, uh, very cryptic galls. And um, here's one of the ones, uh, a cotton wool gall, uh, Andricus quercus ramuli. Um, now, if you're familiar with the robin's pin cushion or bedegua gall on roses, uh, you'll see that this is very similar to it. So whatever, uh, whatever the gall causer is doing with the DNA in, in the oak trees, it's producing a very similar effect to that which um, the, the uh, Diplolepis rosae, which causes the Bidegui gall, uh, very similar uh, results on, uh, on roses. So 
Uh, it's remarkable, really. The, the only thing is these haven't got the red tinge. Um, another genus with just five species in this country, and you may be familiar with these. Uh, the one on the left is, uh, is quite common and widespread, uh, which is um, Cynips quercus folii, known for obvious reasons as cherry galls. Uh, and these remain on the leaves when the leaves fall uh, in the autumn. So uh, you often find them when you're doing an autumn walk and kicking a few leaves up, you suddenly come across some of these uh, on the floor. Uh, both of these species, the uh, sexual generation is on bud galls of oak trees. And then we have spangle galls, uh, neuroterous species of which we have seven in this country. Um, at one time, the one on the left here, Quercus baccarum, um, used to be the most numerous, the most abundant. It's, uh, it's still very widespread, but in recent years, there seem to have been far fewer of them recorded than previously. And the one that's really taken off, and particularly this year, where I live here in the West Midlands, is the one on the right, Neuroterus numismalis, the silk button gall. Um, where, as you can see, you can actually get hundreds of leaves, uh, sorry, hundreds of galls on individual leaves uh, and on a lot of leaves on the same tree. Uh, and this has been absolutely everywhere this year. And this is a feature of gall biology, is that for one or two years, a few years, something will be extremely abundant in a particular place. And then for eight, nine, ten years, it will become, if not scarce, uh, at least far fewer in number. And this may be an effect of the uh, parasitism that takes place within galls. So seven neuroterus, and uh, here's an example of the alternate generation. So uh, the spangle gall on the left is the agamic generation uh, found in the autumn. Uh, and uh, these galls, which unsurprisingly have got the name now of current galls, are caused by the sexual generation on catkins uh, and on leaves in the spring. Uh, another one which is widespread but never particularly common, uh, just the one representative of this genus in this country, Trigonaspis megaptera. Typically find it uh, on the uh, on the boles, on the trunks of trees, often low down as these, um, these are here. And if you open one of these here on the right, you see they have a single gall chamber in the middle. And this one, that's an adult insect, which was obviously about to emerge uh, before this gall was cut open. And the alternate generation of this one uh, is sometimes called the kidney gall. Uh, and it's um, similar in a way to Neuroterus, but uh, it's sort of between Neuroterus and Synips in a, an appearance. Uh, and typically, and this often happens with leaf galls, uh, not only synips, but uh, synips, but, but others as well, um, along leaf veins. So you can see the eggs have been laid along the leaf veins and the midrib. And here, oh, hang on, I'll just show you that again. Uh, and there is the uh, adult Trigonaspis megaptera. Uh, and you can see why it's called megaptera, because it has relatively large wings in relation to its body. And this, I may say, is probably the most attractive adult uh, cinepid wasp. Um, the others are, are mainly all brown and all hunched up, even more hunched up than this one is. Uh, I mentioned turkey oaks. Uh, here's, um, uh, we have one species of pseudoneuroterus in this country. And this arrived um, in Britain, first recorded in 2006. Uh, sexual generation on the right, which is on an acorn, obscuring the acorn, but mimicking the turkey oak acorn cup in the way that the, the, the gall has grown. Uh, and these uh, like miniature carry shells along the midrib of leaves, is the agamic generation. Uh, now all these that I'm mentioning that have arrived in the last uh, couple of decades, um, would actually be interesting to know how many of them you've already got uh, in Scotland and how many of them will arrive uh, over the next few years. There's certainly something for you to look out for uh, in your recording activities. Um, we have um, 
uh, five, five of these, I can't see the figure, I, I can't remember if it's five or three, it's five of these on Quercus ilex, uh, the home oak, Plagiotrochus, um, very distinctive uh, in them. Um, that, this uh, species was first recorded at the Eden Project in Cornwall, about as far away from Scotland as you can get and still be uh, in Britain, uh, in 2004. Um, but they're certainly on the way to you because they're now widespread over the whole of the southeast of England and East Anglia. So they're uh, definitely uh, moving north. And then we have a uh, final one of these, I think. Another one with just the one representative, just some uh, very odd widespread observations of this one, Aphelonyx sericola on turkey oak. It was recorded in Humberside in 1997. Uh, and has since been found in Surrey, Berkshire, Leicestershire and Liverpool, uh, which is really strange because it's a very prominent gall. Um, and yet it has this um, uh, uneven distribution. Uh, I suspect this is to do with the nursery trade and with the importation of um, turkey oaks for ornamental planting and then their distribution around various nurseries. Um, but I don't know, and no one has actually demonstrated that. Um, this one you will definitely have seen, Andricus Kolari, uh, turns brown as the summer goes on. Um, and this is the Agamic Generation Gaul. Uh, this was deliberately imported into this country in the 1830s um, for the tannin. Uh, and to develop a trade, uh, a local trade, so to speak, uh, for the tanning and dyeing industries, as I mentioned earlier, with the Aleppo Gauls. That never really happened because it doesn't concentrate enough tannin, really, compared to uh, others which are uh, cheaper to import and, um, and deal with to get the, the tanning out. There was a lot of uh, concern when it was introduced that... Um, it would cause the demise of oak trees, as there was about the Nopagor, which I showed you the very first slide. Um, but these fears are generally unfounded. Um, most cynipids don't cause any serious harm to the trees. Even the acorn galls, uh, I mean, you can get years where every acorn on a tree has been galled, or it appears that way. But if you think about it, any single oak tree uh, only has to leave one or two descendants in its sort of thousand year life to perpetuate the species. Uh, and in any case, oak trees in Britain, their uh, distribution and abundance is a very anthropomorphic thing. Uh, we plant them, we chop them down, we plant them, we distribute them. It's uh, human activities have far more to do with the uh, population of oak trees in this country than nature itself does. Um, so what about some of this sex and violence then in this particular nutshell? Um, I'll be showing you, uh, recommending a book to you shortly, which has got a lot more of these food webs in. So uh, the arrows go from the victim, so to speak, to uh, its enemy. So here's Andricus Colari, the Gaul causa, which sits in a cell in the middle of the Gaul. Uh, and for a start, there's a whole lot of its cousins, mainly cyanogen species, as you can see here. These are all cynipids that also uh, have cells uh, within the gall and develop in the same way as the gall causa, but they're not the gall causa themselves. So they're lodgers, and the term we use for these is inquilines. Um, so uh, some of them are um, harmless um, as far as Colari is concerned. But Ryan Hardy, this one, uh, is lethal to the gall causa because it, uh, it forms its cells around the gall causa cell and actually crushes it to death uh, and then feeds on the gall tissue itself. The others, uh, Pallidipenis and uh, Galliopomiformis and so on, and this one, uh, their cells are in the outer reaches of the gall and they don't affect the gall causa. But there's a whole lot of calcid wasps which are parasitoids of these uh, cynipids. Uh, so here you see Torimus auratus is a parasitoid of Ryan Hardy. Um, and then uh, it's also a parasitoid of Umbraculus. And if you follow the arrows, the thicker the arrow, 
the more often the association has been recorded. So this one is a very frequent association. Uritoma bruniventris attacking Sinagis umbraculus. Uh, whereas uh, this one here, the Torimus serratus and umbraculus is recorded far less frequently. Um, and uh, although this doesn't show it, because it would probably be too complicated actually and uh, make it impenetrable to watch, the parasitoids will also parasitize each other. Um, so you get hyperparasitoids. And there is just this one shown here, um, this one down in the bottom right hand corner, whose name I can't see, um, meso something, uh, is a parasitoid of Uritoma bruniventris. So um, there's enough going on in here for a soap opera. Um, this is the uh, this is the East Enders or the Coronation Street of the natural world. So those innocent looking little galls that you find and you pick up and examine, there's an awful lot going on inside them. Uh, all sorts of things happening. And it's quite an interesting uh, study to, uh, to breed them out and see what comes out. And so here's what some of the insects look like. Um, this is uh, a typical centipede wasp with its hunched appearance, its brown body. Uh, I've got to move on because I know I'm going over my time. Typical chalcid wasp, a tarimid species, cyanogus, uh, cyanogus species. And uh, going back to the oak apple, this is a most unusual inquiline in the oak apples uh, compared to the uh, chalcids. This is a weevil, Curculio villosus. And it lives quite happily in oak apples. Uh, doesn't do any particular harm to the inhabitants. But interestingly, instead of using an ovipositor to deposit its egg deep into the gall tissue uh, and form a cell to feed in, it actually uses its rostrum, first of all, to bore a hole down into the oak apple and then to lay the eggs uh, in it and push the eggs down into the hole. So uh, that's, uh, that's a bit of an oddball in this context. Uh, a few more newcomers very quickly, uh, Andricus Aries, I think you've probably got this in Scotland, um, arrived in Britain in 1997 when it was found in Berkshire. And strangely enough, at a place where they studied gall wasps. So I think uh, we know how that managed to come in and has these strap-like projections, which nothing else has. And there's one of the adult wasps sitting on the gall. And that's, in, that's probably emerged from there. You can tell what's emerged from the gall by the size of the holes. Large hole like this will be the gall causer. Lots of little pinholes will be the parasitoids emerging. And this one, Andricus gemius, um, arrived in 2008 and has uh, certainly reached Yorkshire and uh, Northumberland. So when will you see it in Scotland? I don't know, let me know. Maybe you already have seen it. It's quite obscure though and quite difficult to see. Uh, and talking about the importance of Turkish oaks, um, not only do we have alternation of generations, we have alternation of hosts. So this one, Andricus grossularii, the agamic, which looks a bit like an upper gall on Quercus roba, and the sexual gall entirely different on Ceres, and the same with Andricus corruptrix, um, that's on Quercus roba and the alternate generation is Unquercus Ceres. Right, and... Sorry, Peter, I'm going to have to hurry yeah, along with okay, you. Just, <laughs> just finishing, to sorry. keep on time. Okay, these are also Turkish connections, the same, alternate generations on different Turkish things. Um, just a quick aside, some of you of a certain age will remember Kinsey and his reports on human sexuality. Well, for the first half of his academic life, he studied gall wasps. And he obviously thought that their sex lives were not complicated enough. So uh, he went on to human sexuality and produced the very famous Kinsey reports. Charles I hid in an oak tree, as a result of which May the 29th uh, was a public holiday in this country until 1859. And people used to wear, particularly for sports of stewards, used to wear uh, a sprig of oak with an oak apple on, on May the 29th. And his father, Charles I, gave the charter to the East India Company. And one of the things they were permitted to import was Gauls. So that was back in the 17th century. That's how important they were. Uh, if you want to know more, 
uh, my presentation is available to you, so I'll just uh, I'll just flash this past you, but you can see some links there online. There's another Gaul, Andricus Quercus Porticus. Um, uh, reference books. Uh, uh, the key is on the left. This very week, I sent the manuscript off to Field Studies Council for the third edition. So if you're thinking of buying it, I would recommend you to wait un until about the middle of next year when the new edition will come out. But otherwise, it is available still. Everything you want to know about Gauls and much more than I've told you is in this new Naturalist by my friend and co-author Margaret Redfern. And the Gaul Society's produced this little colour photograph book with a, a few dozen Gauls in to, to help you along. Lots of people's photographs I've pinched for this presentation, and there they all are. Uh, and finally, another genus, Calaritis, causes very cryptic Gauls, not visible at all from the outside, in acorns. And so there's something called the artichoke Gaul, Andricus fecundatrix. So thank you very much for listening and thank you for letting me put all that to you. Thank you.